In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear brother and sister, fraternal greetings to you from the Carmelite Fathers and warm welcome to Carmel Light reflection on the day's readings. It's the 17th of March. Wednesday of the fourth week of Lent. Today we remember Saint Patrick, Bishop and Apostle of Ireland. Larissa now will enlighten us more about the life and mission of Saint Patrick. On March 17th, Catholics celebrate St. Patrick, the 5th century bishop and patron of Ireland, whose life of holiness set the example for many of the Church's future saints. St. Patrick is one of Christianity's most widely known figures, but for all of his prevalence in culture, namely the holiday held on the day of his death that bears his name, his life remains somewhat of a mystery. St. Patrick was born in Roman Britain to wealthy parents near the end of the 4th century. Although his father was a Christian deacon, it has been suggested that he probably took on the role because of tax incentives and that there is no evidence that Patrick came from a particularly religious family. At the age of 16, Patrick was taken prisoner by a group of Irish raiders who were attacking his family's estate. They transported him to Ireland, where he spent six years in captivity. During this time, he worked as a shepherd, outdoors and away from people. Lonely and afraid, he turned to his religion for solace. Patrick came to view his enslavement as God's test of his faith. During his years of captivity, he became deeply devoted to Christianity through constant prayer. In a vision, he saw the children of pagan Ireland reaching out their hands to him and grew increasingly determined to convert the Irish to Christianity. Around 408 AD, the idea of escaping enslavement came to Patrick in a dream in which a voice promised him that he would find his way home to Britain. Eager to see the dream materialize, Patrick convinced some sailors to let him board their ship and after more than six years as a prisoner, Patrick escaped. A free man once again, Patrick went to France where he studied and entered the priesthood under the guidance of the missionary Saint Germain. He was ordained a deacon around 418 AD. As time passed, he never lost sight of his vision to convert Ireland to Christianity. Patrick reported that he experienced a second revelation. An angel in a dream told him to return to Ireland as a missionary. In 432 AD, he was ordained as a bishop and was soon sent by Pope Celestine I to Ireland on a dual mission to spread the gospel to non-believers and also to provide support to the small community of Christians already living there. Upon his arrival in Ireland, Patrick was initially met with resistance, but managed to spread Christian teachings far and wide, along with other missionaries, through preaching, writing and performing countless baptisms. Recognizing the history of spiritual practices already in place, nature-oriented pagan rituals were also incorporated into church practices. Familiar with the Irish language and culture due to his enslavement, Patrick chose to incorporate traditional ritual into his lessons of Christianity instead of attempting to eradicate native Irish beliefs. For instance, he used bonfires to celebrate Easter since the Irish were used to honouring their gods with fire. He also superimposed a sun, a powerful Irish symbol, onto the Christian cross 
to create what is now called a Celtic cross so that veneration of the symbol would seem more natural to the Irish. Throughout his missionary work, Patrick supported church officials, created councils, founded monasteries and organized Ireland into dioceses. St. Patrick may be known as the patron saint of Ireland, but he was never actually canonized by the Catholic Church. This is simply due to the era he lived in. During the first millennium, there was no formal canonization process in the Catholic Church. By the end of the 7th century, St. Patrick had become a legendary figure and was venerated as a saint. Legends around St. Patrick, which are still told today, include the story that he drove the snakes of Ireland into the sea to their destruction, supposedly after they began attacking him during a 40-day fast. Natural historians have suggested that there is no evidence of snakes having ever existed in Ireland, as the country was too cold during the Ice Age for reptiles to survive. It wasn't until the 1630s that 17th March, the traditional day of St. Patrick's death, was added to the Catholic breviary, a book of prayers, as the feast of St. Patrick. By the late 17th century, Irish people were celebrating the day by wearing crosses, ribbons or shamrocks. The shamrock, according to tradition, was used by St. Patrick to explain the concept of the Holy Trinity to an unbeliever by showing him the three-leaf plant with one stalk. It is now a symbol that has become synonymous with Irish Catholic culture. St. Patrick's Day is observed on 17th March, the supposed date of his death. It is celebrated inside and outside Ireland as a religious and cultural holiday. In the Diocese of Ireland, it is both the solemnity and a holy day of obligation. It is also a celebration of Ireland itself. Traditionally, on St. Patrick's Day, families attend church in the morning and observe other rituals, including eating a traditional meal of cabbage and Irish bacon. The holiday has expanded into the secular world as well, becoming a robust international celebration of Irish culture and heritage. Placing all our petitions before St. Patrick today, let us pray. God our Father, you sent St. Patrick to preach your glory to the people of Ireland. By the help of his prayers, may all Christians proclaim your love to all men. Grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. My dear friends, now let's pay attention to the first reading of the day taken from Isaiah chapter 49 verses 8 to 15. A reading from the book of prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, In a time of favor I have answered you. In a day of salvation I have helped you. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, to establish the land, to apportion the desolate heritages, saying to the prisoners, Come out. To those who are in darkness, appear. They shall feed along the ways, on all bare heights shall be their pasture. They shall not hunger or thirst, neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them. For he who has pity on them will lead them, and by springs of water will guide them. And I will make all my mountains a road, and my highways shall be raised up. Behold, these shall come from afar, and behold, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Sion. Sing for joy, O heavens, and exult, O earth. Break forth, O mountains, into singing. For the Lord has comforted his people, and will have compassion on his afflicted. But Zion said, 
The Lord has forsaken me. My Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child? That she should have no compassion on the son of her womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Can a mother forget her infant, be without tenderness for the child of her womb? Even should she forget, I will never forget you. What a moving image of God and his love for us. A God will never ever forsake us. This would be amazing enough on its own. But let's remember who we are. Sinners who deserve condemnation, not mercy. Isn't that wondrous? His love for us doesn't change based on our behavior. No. He loves us simply because he made us and has bound himself to us eternally. My dear brother and sister, think about how different our love is when compared to God's love. We can be happy one minute and angry the next. We love people more when they are kind to us and we are indifferent to those who disregard us. And even with those we do love, there are some days when it is easier to love and some when it is harder. God's love is never subject to these kinds of ups and downs. He loves us when we fall on our faces. He loves us when we are not faithful to his commands. Quite frankly, he loves us when we are not very lovable. This is not to say God doesn't care about justice. The Israelites had tough times. But God never abandoned them. Even when he had to chastise them, and let them face the consequences of their sins, he never gave up on them. He was always ready to take them back and start all over again. In some instances, God even used their misfortune to teach them and purify them all the more. Now the question is, why is God's love so constant? Well, because he is God, of course. But also because he sees a much bigger picture than we do. God never takes his eyes off his goal for us. To make us into vessels of honor, fit to be filled with his own divine life. He can be patient with us because he has all eternity to work with us. He will never give up on his people. Father, show me your love more deeply today. My idea of love can be so limited so please break through the boundaries I have set up. I want nothing more, Father, than to be filled with your life. Amen. We pray the responsorial psalm, Psalm 145, verses 8 to 9, 13 to 14, then 17 to 18. 
the psalm reminds us that the lord is kind and merciful the lord is faithful to the promises made and is compassionate toward the people of god for the lord is near to all who call upon the lord to all who call upon the lord in truth we pray that psalm now your response the lord is kind and full of compassion the lord is kind and full of compassion the lord is kind and full of compassion slow to anger abounding in mercy how good is the lord to all compassionate to all his creatures the lord is kind and full of compassion the lord is faithful in all his words and holy in all his deeds the lord supports all who fall and raises up all who are bowed down the lord is kind and full of compassion the lord is just in all his ways and holy in all his deeds the lord is close to all who call him who call on him in truth the lord is kind and full of compassion glory be to the father and to the son and to the holy spirit as it was in the beginning is now and ever shall be world without end amen prayer for relief from the corona virus almighty and merciful god who show your love to all creation everywhere hear graciously the prayers we make for all those affected by the corona virus in various parts of the world we come before you asking for an efficacious control of the outbreak for a healing of those affected for the victims and their families we thank you for blessing the efforts of our research scientists working on the development of a vaccine we pray that these vaccines will be effective in combating the virus and its mutants and in controlling the spread of the pandemic we pray that the vaccine be available for all our people even the poor and those in rural areas we pray for doctors nurses and health workers who are in the front line of this battle that they be kept safe and have the strength and courage to continue their heroic efforts we pray for the government and health authorities that they take appropriate steps for the good of the people we make this prayer through christ our lord amen pray for god's blessing now may almighty god bless you the father and the son and the holy spirit amen Finally, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith on Monday released a statement saying the Church cannot bless same-sex unions, adding, however, that this does not imply a judgment on persons involved. Thaddeus Jones explains the Congregation's response. The Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, or CDF, issued a statement which was a response to a question, technically called a dubium. In this case, the CDF says the Church does not have the power to bless same-sex unions. Such blessings, it says, therefore cannot be considered licit, and therefore it is not licit for priests to bless homosexual couples who ask for some type of religious recognition of their union. The CDF says Pope Francis was informed and gave his assent to the publication of the response and an accompanying explanatory note signed by the Prefect, Cardinal Luis Ladaria, and the Secretary, Archbishop Giacomo Morandi. The statement is based on specific assertions and some actual practices. The document situates its response into the context of what it describes as the sincere desire to welcome and accompany homosexual persons to whom are proposed paths of growth in faith, as expressed also in the apostolic exhortation Amoris Laetitia, which speaks of the assistance they need to understand and fully carry out God's will in their lives. Therefore, pastoral plans and proposals in this regard are to be evaluated, the statement notes, including those concerning the blessings of such unions. 
Fundamental to the CDF's response is the distinction that must be made between persons and union. The statement clarifies that the negative response given to the blessing of a union does not, in fact, imply a judgment regarding the individuals involved who must be welcomed with respect, compassion, and sensitivity, avoiding every sign of unjust discrimination as already written in magisterial documents. The motivations at the basis of the negative response consist of the following. The first one regards the truth and value of blessings, which are sacramentals, liturgical actions of the Church, which require that what is being blessed be objectively and positively ordered to receive and express grace according to the designs of God inscribed in creation. The text states that relationships, even if stable, involving sexual activity outside of marriage— meaning outside the indissoluble union of a man and a woman open to the transmission of life, do not respond to the designs of God, even if positive elements are present in those relationships. This consideration not only concerns same-sex couples, but also unions that involve the sexual activity outside of matrimony. Another reason for the negative response is the risk that the blessing of same-sex unions may be mistakenly associated with that of the sacrament of matrimony. I'm Thaddeus Jones. We remember today all those who are celebrating their birthdays, especially Patrick Anthony Joseph from Ahmedabad, Patrick D'Souza from Puruvari, Goa, Rachel Mudaliar from Mira Road, Mumbai, Privit Sayan D'Souza from Katipalla, Udupi, Glorel Fernandez from Mangalore, Wilson Roshan Dimillo from Belman, Udupi. Wish you all a happy birthday. God bless you. We pray for the departed soul of Lena Montero from Manjeshwar, Kasurgod, Santan de Souza from Shambur, Bantwal. May the Lord grant them eternal rest. That's all for today, my dear friends. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.